entire category is too. Thank you very much. OK, so I'd like to start by thanking our organizers, Helmut and Claude, for this wonderful conference. OK, then the next thing I will say is that, you know, since I managed to weed out most of the audience, now we can do examples. So um, the simplest example is in dimension one. So let's discuss dimension one. Uh, well, over R is equal to two. OK, so uh, we're going to let x be an open Riemann surface. And now Q is going to be a ribbon graph this, you know, that, uh, you know, that is a skeleton, so, so as a skeleton of X. So what is a ribbon graph? Well, a ribbon graph is just a graph with the data. Um, so graph plus cyclic ordering of all the edges which, is, which are adjacent to a given vertex. And the only other thing that's kind of useful to know is that such a cyclic ordering is determined by an embedding of the local embedding of the graph in the plane, because you just use the, or this one. OK, so if we just ignore x for a moment and we just have this um, ribbon graph, then we can construct. Um, this a co sheaf of A infinity categories. So B will be this, this co sheaf on Q and the stock at a smooth point. By smooth point, I mean something that's not a vertex. Uh, so this is the co sheaf of categories, is the category, so I will denote just put dot here. So this is the category with one object. And uh, the endomorphism algebra of this object, um, so morphisms, there's only one morphism, well, up to scalar multiplication, which is k times the identity. That's my ground field. So, OK, that's a bit too easy. What happens at the vertices? Well, I have a vertex. Let me just draw locally, something like this. Okay, and I have my cyclic ordering. So now it's associated each one of these edges. I have a, this category here, so let's think of that as a dot. And we have one, two, three, four, five. Two, four, five. And I'm going to order them along the cyclic ordering. Okay, now the category associated to this vertex will be, well, not this disjoint union, but rather they're going to be connected. It's going to be one morphism from here to here, one morphism from here to here. And because everything is cyclically symmetric, there's also one morphism from here to here. Okay, so this is some sort of um, a so a kind of valency minus valency plus one or minus one. C. I have to think. Uh, minus one category. Okay. Uh, oh, and there is one more piece of information, which is that this category is an A-infinity category, so I have to tell you multiplication, I have to tell you higher products. Actually, multiplication is extremely easy. Well, especially in this case. All products are zero, okay? except for things that cannot be zero, which is multiplication by the identity. And higher products, well, they're, again, all zero except for one. That's non-zero. And that one is the higher product where you go around the... Um, the cycle. So M in this case, M5, let's just give them names, x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, x1, 3, x5 is equal to, well, I, I go around and then I end up with a morphism from this first guy to itself. It's equal to the identity, identity of this first guy. And the same thing is true if you cyclically rotate. Okay. So this is the co-sheaf of categories, a co-sheaf of categories, and the point is that this is the co-sheaf that you would get if you applied the construction from last time. So, so B is the result of yesterday's construction. 
And the, geom the geometry behind it, of course, is that you, know, you have these foliations. And I will only use one color today. Well, maybe later I'll use more than that. But you have these foliations on each edges. And over here you have, OK, maybe I'll use more than one color. Why not? Let's have fun. OK, let's do one more. Okay, you have one, two, three, four, five objects. Oops, they should have met. They should have met. There we go. They meet exactly at the boundary. And these five objects correspond to these uh, five dots. Uh, sorry. There should be one more dot. Anyway, the picture and the category don't exactly match up. There should be one more dot in here corresponding to one more object. OK, any questions? And um, last time, there was some criterion that said if the, there's supposed to be some natural map from the homology of Q with coefficients in the Hochschild homology of this category B going into the homology of X, rel boundary. And if this map um, hit the fundamental class, then you could determine uh, the Fukai category of compact Lagrangians, or at least compute Fleur homologies in the Fukai category of compact Lagrangians by looking at some sort of modules over B. And this map is indeed, um, well, it's an isomorphism in this case, but whatever it is, the identity is in the image, fundamental <coughs> class of X is in the image. So there is some class here, let's call it the fundamental class of Q that goes there. And uh, to see this, you just again do the same thing that I, that, that I tried to say yesterday, which is that you notice that um, if I look at the constant holom holomorphic disks on all of these leaves of the foliation, okay, I get a chain that covers everything that corresponds to the edges of the graph. Okay? The boundaries of these chains are the unions of these um, edges that you know, live near the vertex, that correspond to this cat the value of this category near a vertex. And now these, the union of these edges also happens to be the boundary of this holomorphic disk. Okay, so the space is covered by holomorphic disks and leaves. That's the intuition. And because the space of cover is covered by holomorphic disks and leaves, no compact Lagrangian can escape the eye of this category. It sees everything. Okay? So, um, so we have kind of another description of the Fukai category of curves if we needed one. I mean, I guess Denis gave, uh, gave a different version of a description of the Fukai category of curves, although he focused on punctured spheres. OK. So now I want to talk about what would happen in higher dimensional examples. And unfortunately, um, at this stage, I can only um, x. Uh, unfortunately, at this stage, I can only kind of talk about a few examples that I understand. I'm really kind of optimistic that this will work in more generality. So let's, let's do the baby case. So the baby case is going to be, OK, let me say with the baby, baby case. The baby case is Q is smooth, compact smooth manifold. Okay. So yes, yesterday, I had, you know, I did what I didn't when I was talking about co sheaves of categories and algebras. Um, I was working with simplicial sets. Okay? So, what you do is you take this compact smooth manifold and you triangulate it. And then you just, you're the, so let's triangulate, let's choose a triangulation. <clears throat> and then you obtain essentially a constant. Co-sheaf B, uh, whose stalk is is well um, exactly just this category with one object. So there is nothing going on here. This category with one object. That's all it is. Um, and what should this correspond to? This corresponds to uh, the Fleur cohomology 
of the cotangent fiber at a point with itself, where the Fleur cohomology is taken in the um, Nadler Zaslow sense. And you know, if you needed yet, I mean, somehow the this the, this uh, this gives you another proof. Yes, uh, it's 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 by epsilon wrapping. Yes. Although, because some, so because some, the, the great difficulty of what they do with cotangent bundles is handling many Lagrangians that go to infinity and sometimes whose boundaries are not even smooth Legendrians. Here, you don't even, I mean, I'm only going to ever, you know, no, all, they're all orthogonal to each other anyway. All yeah, cotangent fibers. Pardon? Unless they're equal. And when they're equal, you can just compute their, define the flow cohomology using some sort of Morse function that grows at infinity. So it, there's kind of no technical difficulties here. Um, so this is just, you know, yet another proof. Proof that uh, the Foucault category of compact Lagrangians in T star Q embeds inside, well, essentially, uh, modules, I mean, I'm going to just say modules over code chains on Q in the simply connected case. Okay, I don't want to. Q. And this, uh, this also, I mean, if you just interpret this thing, if you go to the construction that I gave yesterday, you'll see that um, you know, it's going to work even things are not simply connected, but it's, it's a bit harder to just identify it with it's, it's not any more modules over code chains on Q. So it's, it's just another statement of what we already know about cotangent bundles. Okay, so now let's do something slightly more interesting, and it's going to be some sort of fiber product of this here and uh, what, ha what we did in dimension one. Okay? <clears throat> um, so I want, so next example. So I want Q is locally modeled after one of these graphs, one of these kind of trivalent vertices, the product of this, with an n one minus one dimensional manifold. Okay. So you can state this. Um, more precisely, if you want, for example, you can say that there exists some collection Q i, which are compact smooth manifolds with boundary. Okay, and then you have, for example, boundary of Q i um, mapping to some. Um, said what I should call it. No, then let's call it something else. Let's call it P, which is an n minus 1 dimensional manifold closed. OK? And this is, um, this is um, diffeomorphism on each component. That is, I could have several components in the source that map to the same thing in, in the target. And now I can just take the union of QI modular this equivalence relation where, this, where somehow the equivalence relation identifies points in boundary QI with the same image in P. And uh, the point is that everything that um, everything that's not in the boundary of the QIs it corresponds to something in this Q. So just Q. It corresponds to something something in this Q where well <laughs> this graph here is kind of bivalent. There's nothing. There's no interesting valency. And uh, if you look at a point on the boundary of QI, then to figure out the valency you just go to P and you see how many inverse images are there. 
that's how you can construct this thing explicitly. So we want to make uh, a, a Stein manifold, or a, let's say just a symplectic, a simple, a Liouville manifold, out of this data, and we can't quite. So to construct, so choose an addition. a locally constant uh, cyclic ordering of the inverse images of points in P. Okay? If I take a point in P, it's going to have inverse images in the boundaries of all the QIs, so that's a collection of points. I'd like to have a cyclic ordering of those, and once I have a cyclic, and I moreover would like the cyclic ordering not to change when I move around P. And so in this way, you can produce again a sheaf, co-sheaf, of A infinity categories on, um, on Q, on the result of gluing everything together. And the way this is done is again, Stalk is, you know, there's just this constant category with one object at smooth points. By smooth points, I mean points that are, don't lie in the boundaries. And it's the exact same category we had before. Uh, this category with one, this is mk equal to the identity, that's the relation, uh, at the singular point. Okay, so that's a Cauchy of infinity categories. And now we would like to have a, 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 a symplectic manifold whose, whose Fukai category is, whose, is related to this. And uh, that symplectic manifold is easy to construct. What you do is you start with the cotangent, so let x equal Take the cotangent bundles of QI, okay, and then that's a manifold of boundary. And then you take the cotangent uh, bundle of P, okay, and you cross. Well, this is going to be a bad picture because it depends on the number of inverse images. The, the P is possibly disconnected, so but let's just just draw a picture. Uh, cross this. Um, surface. Okay, that's my surface. I take the union of these. So union over all i. Union over all i, thank you. Union over all, all i of all these of all these cotangent bundles. And now sorry, maybe here I should have been a bit careful. The map it doesn't go from it goes from the union of the boundary of QI to P. Okay? Because different components in QI could map, could you know, want to be able to glue them together. And then I take the cotangent uh, bundle of P. P is a is is an n minus one dimensional manifold, and I cross it with this disk. But I think of the disk in this very specific way. Okay. And again, here there's a little bit of ambiguity because it's not, you know, how I think about the disk depends about uh, depends on the components of P. Because again, different components of P have different numbers of in inverse images in here. Okay, and then I, I mod out by an equivalence relation. I glue them together, and how do I glue them together? Well, essentially, you know, if I look at, I mean, I I'm just gonna draw a picture. <laughs> I glue them together over here, and here, and here, and here, and here. Okay? Because if I look at the cotangent bundle of QI. And I look at it in the neighborhood in the boundary of the boundary of QI, it just looks like the cotangent bundle of the boundary cross with um, you know, this strip. And then you can just identify the two together. Is the, the map from the numerator to X, is that going to be symplectic? The map from the numerator. The first and first and there is going to be a symplectic embedding of T star QI. Well, essentially, the whole, you can, I mean, there's a question about whether you complete or we don't, you can arrange for an embedding of the whole thing in there, yes. 
Now this guy, you can, depends what you mean by the whole thing of this guy. <laughs> but, but you can certainly arrange for an embedding of the whole thing of this guy. Actually, I will come back to plumbing. It's, it's a, yes, it, you can, one can think of it as a, it is some sort of plumbing along the boundary. Usually plumbings are not done along the boundary, but yes, it's some version of plumbing along the boundary. And my goal today is to explain how the usual plumbing can be understood in terms of, these, of, of these, uh, sort, this construction. So the boundary is... Yes, Katrin. I am not always taking five valent things. So you're saying some of the symmetric components of P, P is, the is constant. constant. Yes, absolutely. That's what I meant about the being a little bit fuzzy. You always cross with a disk, but exactly how you think about the disk, maybe if I drawn it as a disk, and then it depends, you know, the gluing then de depends on the valency. But you're absolutely right. Yes. By the boundary, do you mean the boundary of HQI, of the construct QI, infinity of, when you're plumbing along the boundary? Yes. The, you're plumbing along the boundary where it's, where it's actually the boundary of QI. The, the, so uh, this QI is manifold with boundary. Compact, smooth, manifold with boundary. Okay? And this, it has like the usual boundary at infinity of the fibers, and I'm not doing anything there, but then it also has some sort of boundary where you go to the boundary of the manifold, and that's where the gluing is taking place. Okay? And then you can kind of, you know, when you first do it, it doesn't really look like a smooth manifold with... I mean, it looks like a manifold with corners. You have some round, some corners, but it's, it's not a problem. Th that works out just fine. I think that makes it quicker closing some of these five things and go where the two are. Uh, yes, good. Uh, here. Maybe not on this picture. <laughs> yes. So in, in the previous dimension, for example, let's say P is equal to two points. OK. So. Um, over here, I had, for example, so, so then I have some P's. Okay, and this one, for some reason, sorry, I, I apologize. This one, for some reason, had valency 4, and the other guy, for some reason, is valency 6. Okay? And now, what could my QIs be? Well, I'm just going to, in this case, they're just intervals, and so you just kind of, for example, do something like this. and then fatten everything up. OK, so this was the part which is product of a cotangent bundle of a point with some of these kind of thickenings of spokes. And these are cotangent bundles of manifolds with boundary. And that's the picture. away from, um, so I have this simplicial complex Q, remember, which is obtained by, which is this singular space obtained by gluing these manifolds together. So away from, uh, and moreover, we have an inclusion uh, P inside of Q, okay? So away from P inside of Q, uh, we have, again, uh, category with one object corresponding to the old cotangent uh, cotangent fibers okay this gluing here it takes place at the boundary of qi the part of it Anyway, it's part over the boundary of QI. So if you, if you don't lie on the boundary, then the fiber at such a point survives this gluing. Just so, see where it goes. So Q now is the union of the QI plus the, the five. No, so you, yes, so the way I think of this is Q is the union of the QI modulo an equivalence relation. But you could think it is topologically the same as the union of the QI plus the stars cross P. It is just topologically the same. 
And it's, yeah. But the key observation is that if we're sufficiently close to P, close to a point in P, then this is just, uh, this is cotangent fiber <coughs> in P, in T star P, crossed with an interval, crossed with this. So, you know, we're very close. We're very close to this spoke, to the central guide, to the central vertex here. We have our skeleton, which kind of looks like this. And now I take something like that. Okay. If, if this cotangent fiber, the cotangent fiber to, smooth, to a point in the smooth part, the point in the smooth part, it could be very, very close to this, to this point in P here, to a point on the boundary. And if it's there, I can think of this cotangent fiber as just a cotangent fiber to P crossed with somehow a cotangent fiber of an interval, of a point on the interval. So, so to keep constructing our co sheaf of A infinity categories, so given a point in P, so what we want, we, so we, t we take, so let's call it P and P, so we take T star P at P, that's the cotangent fiber, crossed with this collection of Lagrangians. Okay. And the reason I made this comment here is because if I take my family of if, if I take if I take a Lagrangian here, which I think of as living in the cotangent fiber to the smooth part, and I move this edge down, then I will get a subcategory of the category associated to the point right here. Okay. And just as before, um, you know you can identify this edge here. Well, essentially you can just move it by homotopy to get an edge here. So, uh, so this gives me the value of B at a singular point. And, and then we have this co-sheaf structure. structure. So co it's really co-restriction structures. From smooth part. The singular part. Okay. So what is particularly convenient about this picture is that locally everything is a product. And not only is locally everything is a product, locally everything is a product of extremely simple things. Whenever two things meet, they're always of the form same guy, same cotangent fiber here, cross some edges in the plane. Okay? So unlike other situations where it's hard to pass from something happening on a symplectic manifold to something happening to its product and to control and controlling holomorphic disks, here you just kind of project. You see that there is indeed um, a non-trivial holomorphic disk that survives. That's what allows you to say what the, you again compute what the A infinity category associated to P is. It's the same as what we had before. And a priori, you, it's hard to know that there aren't any other disks, but there's a deformation theory, Huxley, well, anyway, there's a Huxley cohomology argument that says that you don't need to check whether there's any more disks. So let me just write that down. So by projecting locally, so we compute that the stock at P, little p in P, is again, uh, has the same A infinity structure as in the one dimensional case. Okay, I think that answers something that Chris 
ask me about. So Chris won, pardon? Yes, so, so it turns out that this category here, um, so you could ask yourself, what are all A infinity structures in this category with the property that multiplication agrees with what you know multiplication to be? So you know that multiplication yeah. is 0. Multiplication is M2, or uh, M2. Okay. OK? And there is a Hochschild cohomology computation which says, that up to A infinity equivalent, such categories are determined by whether or not this, exactly, the first one that goes all the way around, whether that's non-zero or not. So you check it, you check that it's non-zero, and everything else, so once, it's, once you know that that's non-zero, everything else is equivalent to it. Of course, there could be some other holomorphic disk that you're not keeping track of. Okay, but you still have to make sure that. The you still have to make sure that this yeah, disk is regular. With these yes, edges. with these five edges, you have to check that this the only holomorphic disk with these five edges. So then you say you don't care what's more complicated. Yes, okay. what could be there that's more complicated? Mm -hmm. You have to so make sure. The multiplication is easy because things don't intersect. So this is just <laughs> what is topologically the category really has these finitely many objects. This is a this is a disk. Its Fleur cohomology with itself is of rank one. Only it has the identity. This is a disk, this is a disk. This disk and this disk don't intersect. It's like, it's like a cotangent fiber. It's this cotangent fiber in P cross one of these edges. So topologically, it's just, I don't know, maybe we shouldn't call it disk, it's a ball, n dimensional ball. This guy doesn't intersect this guy. So their Fleur homology is zero, so the composition is zero. And that, of course, survives when I take the product of the same file. <coughs> then you have worked the same way with all higher Yeah, but except for one of them. I mean, and, and M10 and M15. If you go all the way around, then now your, your output is the Fleur cohomology of this with itself. Uh. So take the, take the higher product of this arrow. Doop, doop, doop back here, yeah. that could a priori be non-zero, it is non-zero. That's what you get out of this. I don't know whether you get an M10, but I claim that it's not important because there's some deformation argument that takes care of it. In fact, I feel like you could check that it's, you just have to think about grading. I think there can't be an M10 for grading reasons, but, but I didn't want to think about it yet. But I know that, that it, it, you can just deform it away. Okay. So, um, great. So, whoa, doo -doo 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 -doo. Okay, so um, now I claim that this kind of uh, construction, which I don't know what to call them, I want to call them kind of whatever. They're like, they're, they're like yes, exactly. They're plumbings along boundaries of cotangent bundles. That's what they kind of look like, um, generalized in some sense. Um, that this construction can satisfy the, the condition. Um, so, th sorry, this category satisfies that generating hypothesis from yesterday. So once again, uh, if you care about compact Lagrangians in these spaces, what, you know, you can compute Fleur cohomologies of compact Lagrangians by associating to them sheaves, modules, over this, this co-sheaf of categories, and then computing. I said last time I said tor, and in general I don't know how to make it x, but for these examples you can make it x of, bimodule, of, of modules. So for these examples, uh, so I can 
compute hf star compact Lagrangian from the associated modules. So just somehow want to say these things exist. Now, next thing I want to say is explain that this is not that unfamiliar a construction. So next thing I want to explain is that every, you know, plumbing in the classical sense of cotangent admits such a skeleton. of this type. OK? So let me be more precise. So now, uh, unfortunately, slight change of notation. Uh, maybe I shouldn't. Let me just use different, different words. So let, let n1 and n2, these smooth manifolds, which are closed manifolds. And let me choose b, which embeds inside both of these. OK? Oh, this is not a good choice. I'm sorry. Oh, OK, fine. We'll, we'll live. Um, with isomorphic normal bundles, so, so embeddings. with isomorphic normal bundles. OK? So the point is that let's write this normal bundle V. <coughs> so the point is that a neighbor, so if I look at, sorry, here's N1, here's B. OK? If I look at uh, a neighborhood of B, and I look at everything in n in t. This is t star n one. Okay. If I look at everything in t star n one that look that lives above this neighborhood of B, then that looks like so. This topologically is going to be actually in fact symplectically, it's going to be B C cross over B with t star B. So this is a neighborhood of B in t star n i. The reason, so this is, the, this is like two copies of V. V is the normal bundle. Uh, and one of them corresponds to the copy in this direction, and the other one corresponds to the copy in this direction. OK? But this thing has an involution, which is you multiply this by i. Okay, you switch what you think of as being imaginary or real. Alternatively, you switch with this being horizontal and vertical. So what you can do is you can glue t star n1 and t star n2 along this guy. <coughs> B, keeping in mind this involution. Okay. So here you include with the standard inclusion, and here you include by applying the involution. That's And this space has a name, and I will call it just T star. Well, first of all, its name is the name is the, the plumbing of the two cotangent bundles along B, and I'll just write it like that. Okay. So the simplest picture we've already seen. Uh, it's in dimension one, and it's just a slightly different way of thinking about Riemann surfaces. You know, this is. T star R, and you know, here's another copy of T star R. Okay, and then we're gonna glue them together along this square, and really this square is my VC in this case. But you could do this, you know, the way I set this up, you can do this along any sub manifold. B doesn't have to be connected, N1, N2 don't have to be connected. You can get whatever, you know, you can get many things this way. Okay. So um, the simplest thing one would hope for 
is that the machine I described yesterday would just apply directly to this. Okay? This has a nice skeleton, and you can just you know, try to see whether you can find a family of Lagrangians parameterized by it. And the problem is it doesn't directly work. Okay? So the problem, so if the dimension of Ni, actually it's really if, if the co-dimension of B, write it correctly, if the co-dimension of B is uh, greater than 1, then no nice family, family of Lagrangians in this plumbing to parametrize. Of course, I'm not saying there aren't any Lagrangians. I'm saying there are none that satisfy the hypotheses that I was assuming yesterday. That's what nice means. By uh, n1 union along b with n2. And the reason is essentially local. I mean, you, the, pr the problem is entirely local. So let's just do um, n1 is equal to r2 is equal to n2. b is a point. The origin. Okay? I won't draw n2. I'll just draw n1. Looks like this. And here's the origin. And now, I mean, it's clear what should happen away from this point. Okay? We should have the family of cotangent fibers. Okay? So over here, you have the cotangent fiber at this point in, in N1. Um, okay? Because that's about that cotangent fiber, so this is T star at Q of N1. That's the Lagrangian you, associ you should associate to it. And then um, that not varies very nicely away from the origin. But the key, one of the key properties that I had yesterday that I needed to assume was that when you, know, when you took a cell a simplex of your, of your, of your simplicial complex, that the choice of Lagrangians kind of made sense at the boundary as well. Okay? I always said everything is a closed cell. We have a family of Lagrangian parents with a closed cell. We can restrict it to the boundary, and then some, sa some properties are supposed to be satisfied. Well, here, there is no way of extending this choice all the way to this point. The natural choice of cotangent fibers doesn't extend over here. The cotangent fiber at this point has been removed and replaced by the zero section of N2. So you can't, you just can't apply this. Uh, so the idea yeah. which, OK, so it's, somebody explained this to me, and I don't know who it is. And so therefore, I'm just going to say it was Kinsevich. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, I remember the conference, and he was there, and talked about related things. So it sounds reasonable. OK, so the idea is that this, this space has another plumbing. Has another, I'm sorry, has another skeleton. This plumbing has another skeleton. Okay? And you can already see this in dimension one. So in dimension one, you replace this picture by the following thing. First, you smooth this intersection a little bit, and you get this picture. Okay? But that has the wrong topology. Or rather, somehow, you know, a neighborhood of this has the wrong topology. So you add this additional interval here. So you traded your four valent vertex for two three valent vertices. Okay? So how to do this in general? Um, so just in general, well, you just, um, well, I'll just say the, the, the plumbing has a skeleton. With three smooth components. Which are the following thing. 
they are q1 minus a neighborhood of b. So open neighborhood of b. Okay. It's bound, the, the, the boundary of this open neighborhood is going to be some sort of sphere bundle over b. Okay. Pardon? I'm wondering if you want to know. Um, thank you. N1. So that's one piece. The other piece is the same thing with N2. Now, of course, one of the first assumptions I said is that the embeddings of B1 and B2, uh, of B in N1 and N2, have the same normal bundle. That means that these two manifolds have the same, have the same boundary. Okay? But there's another manifold that has the same boundary, which is the disk bundle. Bundle of V. V is the normal bundle. Anyway, let me just write the words of normal bundle of B. So these are three manifolds with boundary, and they have the same boundary. And I kind of not really started this talk, but somehow the half, the middle part of this talk was about saying that if you have this, this situation, and if you have an ordering of these, and you just order them like this. Okay, so this is ordering, cyclic ordering. Then you obtain, well, first of all, first of all, you obtain a um, space just by gluing these together. It's going to be locally just trivalent cross manifold. It's going to look like a trivalent vertex cross manifold. Um, and the cyclic ordering equips it with a uh, Cauchy for A infinity categories, which is exactly the same one we were talking about this whole time. Okay, so that's that was just the explanation that you can do this in higher dimensions, and you get a different uh, skeleton for the plumbing. And once you have this different uh, skeleton for the plumbing, um, you can just so yeah. Yes, this is symplectomorphic to the plumbing, and you can see this local. Uh, you can see this locally. You just so you just have to see this in um, in in so absolutely in one higher dimension in and in, in all higher dimension. <coughs> okay, so first of all, you do in the normal direction. It's this picture in all higher dimensions. <coughs> uh, so you replace what? Well, let me just let me just say a few words about what this picture means in higher dimensions. Uh, so if this is R n and this is R n. Uh, then this guy here, which you obtain by smoothing, is topologically something like R cross SN minus 1. Okay? Because this is uh, the direction at which you have SN minus 1 cross R, but you also have the same thing up there, and they've, they've been glued together. And this manifold, you can just write down an equation for a Lagrangian manifold satisfying this condition. Uh, but, and then this is uh, just a, a disk that you fill in. And, well, the total thing kills... Once you put in this disk, you kill this SN minus 1, so you end up with something contractible. So the, R, the SN minus 1 is just the younger coding of R, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. In fact, on both of them, because kind of you're going to identify it by complex multiplication, but yes. Um, and once you put in this disk, all of kind of, well, this is. No, only one. SN minus 1 is uh, special in N equals. For N equals 1, it's not connected. That's why it looks not disconnected. So in the next dimension, you're really going to see kind of, I don't, I'm not good at drawing this, some, some tube that goes like this and goes up, and then that's what it looks like in the next dimension. And you can just embed this in the local model that you use for the plumbing. OK. So. So I want to end with some, so anyway, so n now I've explained how you can kind of apply this machine to um, plumbings of cotangent bundles. So I want to end with some uh, questions about Lagrangian embeddings in cotangent bundles. Um, so first I'll state a, a theorem uh, joined with Ivan Smith. Uh, which is about very special situation, which is 
uh, you know, let n1 equal n2 equal, say, a sphere, and let n be greater than 2, and let b be a point. OK? A theorem says in, so this, by the way, the space that you get by this plumbing is called the A2 Milner space. Okay. But anyway, we don't need to know this. So in T star Sn, glued along point with T star Sn, all exact Lagrangians, closed exact Lagrangians, Lagrangians of Maslow index 0 are equivalent in the Fukai category to, well, well, it's to an iterated Dane twist Dane twist of, let's say, n1. Okay, let me explain the statement. So, a point, a point, a point. So, Inside this plumbing, you have the old zero sections, n1 and n2. And if people are familiar, this, this is the one-dimensional picture. Now, in the one-dimensional picture, you can take the circle and you can do Dane twist about the other circle. And you get another Lagrange. And it'll also be exact, and it will also have the same Maslow index. <coughs> the same thing happens for spheres. If you have a Lagrangian sphere, there is a notion of a Dane twist. And the theorem says, if you have a Lagrangian muscle of index 0 closed, then from the point of view of the Foucault category, you cannot distinguish it from some twist of the zero section by the other one, and then you do it five times, and then you go back and twist by the old zero section, by the, by the other components, and so on and so forth. Okay? So in particular, uh, all, all such Lagrangians are homology spheres. And in fact, if you do a little bit of work, you can show their fundamental group vanishes. But don't really, I mean, not go there because that's not what I want to ask. 